Hello, and welcome to the virtual Scandinavia house in New York and today's talk with two of the directors of the Finnish film Force of Habit, Rita Alto and Ali Hapasalo. The film is now screening virtually at ScandinaviaHouse.org. Force of Habit is an award-winning film by seven directors that shows us moments in women's lives that usually remains hidden. Ali Hapasalo is a writer and director. She graduated from the Aalto University School of Motion Pictures, Television and Production, Production Design in New York's uh, Film School, uh, the Tisch School of the Arts, as well as being an American Scandinavian Foundation Fellow. She made her feature debut with Love and Fury in 2016 and co-directed the television show Shadow Lines, a Cold War political drama with AJ Anala. Rita Alto is a film director and screenwriter for both fiction and documentaries. Her works include Great Violet, Odd One Out in 2017, which premiered at Hot Docs uh, Film Festival, and the award-winning internet hit animation Pussy for Beginners in 2015. And as a director of the well-known Pricks, Pricks Europa nominated miniseries Paradise in 2010, and the award-winning comedic short films Girls Night in 2008 and um, Inspection in 2015. So welcome, Ali and Rita. Thank you. Thank you. So I always like to just start off at the beginning because I think it's a very interesting concept. Uh, I, uh, can you tell us how this project came about and how did you get involved? And I do hate to ask this questions, but are some of these stories told based on personal experiences? I will try to give you the short version of this because the <laughs> birth process of this film was quite a lengthy one, but. I guess if I begin, Reta, then you can continue. There were basically a bunch of uh, female writer directors who got together at the production uh, company's uh, Tufi Films office. We were invited by the Tufi Films uh, producer Eli Toivoniemi and writer uh, Kirsi Kasari. And we all got together basically to share our experiences on gender bias, our experiences both in work life and in our private lives just stories, what kind of thoughts we had on the matter. Uh, I should point out this was pre Me Too. It wasn't inspired by it, but it was just something that we all had sort of become a little bit tired of and wanted to <laughs> share some thoughts and, and share experiences. <clears throat> and right from the get-go, the idea was to do something with this frustration and with this energy and with this sharing and with this power that we all had together. It wasn't entirely sure what we would be doing, but that first meeting started a process of several meetings, workshops, get togethers and discussions and conversations. And, um, and also then um, we all started to write short films um, that we would be directing. And that sort of started, um, started everything that ended up in this this feature, right? do you want to? Yeah, uh, I mean, from the get go, the idea was to make films, but like what format exactly, we weren't quite sure of. I think from quite early on, we came up with the idea of a feature length film, which would be kind of like an episodical one, but uh, perhaps you don't know, but Force of Habit is actually a bigger project than just this feature length film, it also includes 11 individual uh, short films and an outreach campaign. Uh, so it, it's this massive kind of <laughs> mastodon. But uh, yeah, and also uh, in the beginning, there was just us filmmakers there, but uh, very soon we invited also uh, people from other arts and uh, uh, scientists and activists to join and that helped uh, us to form these ideas of ours and we all worked on our scripts kind of like uh, we were free to do whatever we wanted but Kirsi Kasari who was like the, the main uh, script writer in this project was kind of co coordinating us all so that our subject matters uh, wouldn't be, would be different enough, but still on the same table. Right. And, uh, and in terms of, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just go on. 
Uh, you asked if they were personal, and I think in, in how we came up with the, all of the topics and what we were developing, they were personal stories for some, personal observations for some, um, then perhaps not at all. Maybe, maybe somebody had a story to share and somebody else picked it up and sort of developed it. And so, you know, in my instance, for example, my short film that's included in Force of Habit is... Uh, <laughs> partly per verbatim <laughs> my my personal experience whereas I know Reta's story is something that was inspired by what had happened to someone else then shared and developed by Reta so yeah it was a very collaborative effort. And can you tell which part what sections were yours just for the audience? Um, my short film was called No Big Deal and in the feature it's the story of the couple that's in Lisbon in Portugal on vacation and uh, the woman gets groped by the local guy at the restaurant. And my short film was called Buduar and uh, in the feature it's called Bedroom. It's the one that happens after a party in, in bedroom. <laughs> And 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 since it was it started off as a series of as you said eleven shorts, um, do you feel? I mean, one thing that I felt so strongly with the film, and I think what you was one of the 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 the, um, the strengths of the film was the editing and how they wove the seven stories together. Um, and is sort of as a viewer, you're really not giving a lot any room to escape because as soon as you sort of get a little bit of breathing room as a viewer, you're hit with the uh, with the next story. Um, do you feel like there's a different viewing experience by watching them as individual shorts or as a more of a, the interwoven collective, the seven films, even woven together? Definitely, but I wish there were more screenings of all the 11 right. films together because that right. also is something now they are all online available in Finland mm -hmm. so um, so that's great it's part of this outreach campaign but if you just watch one film it it really doesn't give you the whole picture <laughs> so we really wanted these all be like little bits and pieces of the same puzzle even though they are artistically and otherwise like their own stories but mm -hmm. and I think that's a really wonderful way to put it Kyle that you kind of can't escape it because if one story is over in a way or or someone escapes the terrible situation the next one is behind the corner really right. and this reminds me of also something um, that happened in development that we are so in our society we're so accustomed to belittling these no big deals that even we questioned in the beginning of this process is this big enough a topic for a feature and i swear that if one of us had written a story alone about gender bias and taken it to find for financing it would not have been financed but since this was this whole group of people and a whole variety of stories you could not deny it it was happening. It is a topic. It was a big topic. And that we could then see when the film came out that there were people were really recognizing this story and mm -hmm. everybody wanted to share theirs after they saw it. It was it was like a big, big recognition of finally someone's put into words what I felt. Right. And the most innocent scene in the film was the very last scene where uh, the theater actress was walking in, in the park alone and you just saw this man walking behind her and it was completely innocent and the man didn't do anything. He just walked on past, but you just thought the worst um, after seeing uh, all these stories unfold for uh, 75 minutes. So, um, and I guess that brings up a next question is how did the funding, uh, was it difficult to secure funding because you know, as you said, this was before Me Too. So, I mean, I, I, I know Finland could be very generous in, in um, the, the, the grants that the, you can receive as filmmakers, but did they feel like this was a necessary at that time before the Me Too movement really started kicking off? 
Well, Me Too happened parallel to our okay. uh, producing it. So um, we hadn't gone into production yet before it happened. And there was a quick five minutes of like, uh oh, I hope this doesn't mean that then now somehow the conversation is suddenly had and we can't do this. But quite quickly, we realized Me Too was just the very beginning of a long conversation. So we definitely were not losing our cutting edge, if you can say that. We were quite topical still when we came out and still would be. Right. Um, uh, financing happened in bits and pieces and uh, producer Elli Toivoniemi really has done a completely magnificent job with it. First, we only produced four films. We had secured funding for four films. Reta and I were in the very first bunch to make ours and then more money was being applied and then more films were being made, the short films and then the feature still applied for post-production money to be made uh, from these shorts that we had. So it was very much a puzzle to put together. But it was really due to the attitude that Eli Toivon Emi had, like she said from the beginning, that we, we're just going to make these films like no matter what. And then we got money, yeah. more and more money as we went on so these four films worked also as as kind of a pitching tool then to finance the, the rest of the bunch but even if we did find money along the way it's still a very low budget film right. so, yeah. 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 and then how has the reception been um, in Finland as well as an international uh, reception and a question that I also am interested in hearing is is the right audience seeing the film well, I think here uh, the outreach campaign comes into play uh, in Finland that I would say is the most <laughs> significant thing mm. because the materials, there's a lot of information about each topic uh, and, and helpline numbers and discussion uh, kind of introductions uh, to, to how to discuss these topics with uh, let's say like a class in a classroom or workplace or where it may be mm -hmm. and I know in Finnish schools the, the films are, are being watched and discussed a lot and I think to reach the young people was kind of very important for us because I mean they are the ones who still have so much in front of them to, to experience and we would hope that the world would be better for them than it has been for us when it comes to these, these kind of issues. And uh, then of course the film festivals and, and all that, um, it's a certain type of crowd usually that comes to film festivals and, and that's wonderful. But out of the like live audiences, I think the main group has been a bit older women. <laughs> which which come come sharing their stories and and feel super fu frustrated that that this is how things still are they kind of thought that well maybe the younger generation has already had different kind of world but <laughs> the film revealed that no mm. <laughs> but yeah so it i don't know but it has been very well received, like we've gotten several awards and, right. and, and also like uh, by, by the cinema, cinema people. <laughs> but I think the main point is the young, young people. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because somehow now there's vocabulary for this that there wasn't for before, you know, like we couldn't put into words these things. Like when I was 20, I was groped at the office and you, do, you, you didn't have you know, you were just sort of supposed to laugh it off, but now 20 some years later, there's vocabulary and there's kind of like, you know, an easier time perhaps or hopefully to, to call out on it. But it's true, there's been a lot of anger um, in people's responses because it's a frustrating thing to feel that this is going on. There's a lot of confessionals. Mm. I, I get people come to me and they say, oh, God heard myself in those lines like you know both men and women it's right. been very important to us 
to not have this attitude in the making of this film that we are some great uh, <laughs> commentators of society who come and you know, shine a light on all this wrongdoing and we tell you how you should be behaving. It's much more like we want to shine the light on all of us and acknowledge the fact that we all uphold unhealthy behavior and unhealthy structures. And, uh, and yeah, the film really raises lots of conversations about that. Like I've never been to a film premiere before the premiere of this film where people spoke that much about the topic of the film. Usually you have like a couple of drinks and then you move on to talking about other things. Right. But the whole night, everybody was sharing their experiences and their emotions. And it was like, suddenly there was this forum for all these untold stories. And so I would say that's the main response that the conversation is happening. That's our best reward in a way. And what we've learned about the screenings in other countries, this has happened there too. Of course, now because of the COVID, people don't get together, but there, there have been like discussions and people have contacted us personally also to, to share their stories. <laughs> So it has really, we were kind of wondering, like, is this just a Finnish thing for a while also? But it seems like no. not. <laughs> no, definitely <laughs> it's an not. international definitely. thing. Uh, and and it, you answered some of this, this next question already. But as like a viewer, and especially as a male viewer, as you, as you were mentioning that, you know, men you saw themselves in the, in the male position in, in these films. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And and you even if you may not have overtly sexually harassed anyone, I mean maybe we all have. I I, I don't know. Um, I I mean I remember just I watched it in Gothenburg last year uh, with you um, at the film festival. I, I I remember just having this incredible sense of guilt, um, and then and then after that guilt sort of went away. Uh, not that it really went away. I just didn't know what to do. You know, um, so I was wondering, as as the role of the director and the writers, do you feel like it's just the role of of you just to, you know, just put the spotlight on and but but not provide any answers and just make the audience, you know, seek the answers themselves, or do you feel like you should, you know, like you should pr provide an answer uh, or if I know this is a very difficult answer to provide but uh, I, I'm just wondering what you thought about that. I think it's a really good question. Um, I, I personally think it is okay to just raise the questions and you don't have to provide an answer if you provide good food for thoughts and good conversation. Um, but I certainly also don't think it hurts to provide some answers maybe also. And I think that's why with this film, because this is a very emotional topic also, and I know that there's a lot of younger audiences, for example, who have, like I've spoken to, to young women who come full of fury and, 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 you know, like with red cheeks and, you know, they have, they want to discuss it and stuff. So I think it's important with this film also that we do uh, for example, guide people to several different addresses uh, online or other resources if, if they want to talk about it more because we can't be there after every time someone watches it. And um, if in Finland, if you go to the uh, website of Force of Habit, there's an enormous amount of resources. Like Reetta mentioned, there's also professionally made guided conversations and conversations points. Um, but in the film itself, I think it's better if it leaves room for thought or if it leaves you answering, um, asking and answering questions. I can speak for my film. I've, um, it was important to me that in the story of this couple, it wasn't so that the woman was a victim and the man was a fool, you know, who doesn't understand what's happening. It was very important for me that it was their, both of their powerlessness right. in in what happened that was the main thing, that the groper had the power and, and uh, they both, neither of them could do anything. Like you said, you felt like I can't do anything. The right. woman feels like she can't do anything and the husband feels like he can't do anything. So where are you left off? 
And I've, I've heard comments, for example, that because it's such a minor thing, so to speak, that someone just touches your butt, you know, not serious, right? And I've heard people have watched it and they've been kind of like, hmm, what is this woman in an expensive red silk dress complaining about? And then they've gone, what did I just think? Mm -hmm. Did I just freaking say that to myself? And that starts like then whole new snowball effect of like how we're all doing this in, in ways that we don't necessarily even recognize. So lengthy answer, which probably, did, probably didn't answer you at all. But I, I, I hope that the film itself can raise people to have sort of more thoughts and more answers or keys to starting to answer things. Yeah, I, I could add like that. I think we've already done a great deal of like it's not a small thing to <laughs> to to show these things and that we found the courage as we said that we were debating whether you know this is even a subject matter you know there's more perhaps dramatic incidences and occurrences in in people's lives than perhaps these that we portray but to do it in a way that we all recognize ourselves in those situations. And, and we have, I would, I would claim we have this feeling that I've never seen this before. Like I've experienced this in this or that role, but I've never seen this in a film. And I think this is a quite, I mean, I'm honestly thinking that this is a revolution, <laughs> like that we actually see these things. So that's a great thing already. And Kyle, you've done a great deal too by recognizing this and feeling what you're feeling. And how to fix this is not easy because it's like every day, minute by minute, how we behave and what we do. And it's not about those bad harassers or those, like it's not about demonizing anybody. We are all in this together like women men everybody we we all kind of like as Ali said we all participate in this kind of like the, the, keeping these structures there so I mean it's difficult it's difficult for me too I'm not saying <laughs> like I don't know I, I make mistakes and I might turn my eyes you know seeing something complicated happening maybe I'm afraid maybe I don't want to you know Maybe I see some drunken people and there's something I don't want to take part often, like let's say in a public transportation when I witness something happening. It's, it's tough, but yeah. as, as if we just open our eyes and try to remember it every day <laughs> in our everyday lives, like little by little things. And just try to be better. Yeah, yeah. So my, the next point I would like, um, because it's also related to one of the stories in the film, is there's been a lot of discussion, at least in the US, uh, about director's behavior on the set uh, with bullying um, and, and the male gaze. How do you work with your actors and how do you handle the diff difficult situations that a scene requires? Well, well I Okay, Go ahead. <laughs> well, I can say that we, we talked a lot, like before we did anything, we, we talked about everything, like, and those who wanted could share their personal experiences about, about this. And, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, all the intimate scenes were like, very carefully choreographed. So all of the actors knew exactly what's going to happen. So uh, those are, I think those are two key points. And Ali might want to continue. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say um, basically if I had to say if I have a directorial method, it would be inclusion. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to uh, sort of, there's this glass between actors and uh, actors in front of the camera and and um, filmmakers behind the camera. The lens there somehow divides us into us and them. And I, I work quite hard to diffuse that or to even get rid of it so that instead of us and them, there would just be us. 
And um, that basically means exactly the same as Reta said, talking. I talk about everything. I share all my plans. Uh, I'm currently working with the film. Actually, it's being edited in the next room with lots of intimacy. There's three young women in, in the leads. And um, um, also, all those scenes were choreographed. And in this particular instance, there was an intimacy coordinator who's a professionally trained specialist in those scenes uh, who also rehearses with the actors so that all those scenes are easy and, and uh, comfortable to do. But that's not all. Uh, it also, you know, you have, I feel like as a director, I'm collaborating with equals rather than I come with my vision and you can now fulfill my needs. That's not, that's, that's kind of like the old old uh, world thinking or the genius director thinking I don't believe in genius directors um, and uh, and I believe in collaborating and in you know we're, we're everybody's doing their art everybody's an equal creator of of the film that we're making so we just do it together so I think that will then diffuse this sort of power dynamic that could also be a little bit tricky uh, otherwise um, or that can, I, I think in those bully situations or, or if there's bad directing on set, that's always misuse of power. But if you strip down power, then hopefully you're collaborating better. And I, I, I just remember I interviewed a, a filmmaker and an actress uh, in January, uh, part of the Oscar campaign series. And um, there was a rape scene in that film. And I asked her like, as an actor and as a director, how do you prepare for a scene like that? And you know, and all she basically said is it's as difficult and the body remembers. And I did, and I keep, and you know, when I was coming up with these questions, that was one of the first thing I wrote was the body remembers. So how do you, and, and, and you talk equally with your actors uh, and actresses, um, but is there any way beyond that once the scene is over with, how do you sort of flush, flush that away or move on. I, I guess that's, I, I, I don't know what kind of point I'm trying to make right here, but. Um. I think I understand your point. That's part of what the intimacy coordinator does. Mm -hmm. um, this film that I'm working on was the first experience that I had with an intimacy coordinator and they have really wonderful specific methods for that kind of thing. So that you are not, as the actor, you're not in that rape scene as yourself, but very much as the character. Mm -hmm. And you can also quite physically step into the character and step out of it. One of the easy methods in, in the scenes we were doing, I didn't have actually any rough scenes like that uh, but, for example, uh, one of the methods she used was sort of bringing the person back to presence very much, uh, so, uh, sort of say three things that you see uh, immediately in this room right after the scene, for example, like really like shake off what just happens and really bring you back to who you are. So that's just the one tiny example of the different methods that that she used. It's. I don't mean to make it sound like magic, of course, <laughs> it's very much human behavior and I'm sure the body can still remember. And even with all these rehearsals and practices and methods, it can still be a tricky thing, I'm sure. I don't act so I don't know personally, but, but there are definitely things that you can do. And now this is becoming a, a um, very uh, sort of important and big role on set started in the US a few years ago, uh, Me Too really started it and then came to the UK and now all of Europe is is using intimacy coordinators. So that certainly helps. Is it required to have one on set if the scenes need it? It's um, required. I don't think that it's recommended. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, you can't really say you can't require, I guess, anything, but I would say that, like one of my colleagues said the other day, it's no longer kosher to do a uh, intimacy scene without one. So it's, it's um, colloquially required, I would say, which is a good thing. Yeah, actors, professional actors usually are ready to do whatever, like they, they are somehow built that way that they say, always like yeah 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 let's just do it and whatever and you can punch me in the face and whatever and 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 
in Finland at least, everybody is used to these small budget uh, films, and, and and everybody just wants to do their best. And and then now, because of Me Too, for example, we started talking about this more, and I've realized that it's also like directors' responsibility to kind of say that, hey, okay, I know you could do this, but that can actually hurt and be dangerous. So let's do it this way. <laughs> so like, don't get too excited and, and kind of like, kind of try to make it so that, you know, they know that we all want the best possible and realistic material, but it doesn't have to hurt anybody physically or emotionally. And, uh, well, this is not such a cultivated answer, but I think it's a powerful tool after a scene just to ask, how are you? Are you okay? Is everything okay? <laughs> and so forth. I mean, a lot of the direct thing is just normal communicating with our fellow beings. So <laughs> to, to be a good director is often to be a good, a good like just fellow <laughs> i think um next i would like to talk about representation in film and its importance uh do you feel that finland needs to adapt in a quota system since a lot of finnish films are um, dependent on st uh, state grants um uh that does not only represent gender but also sexuality minority and racial identities among others I used to be against them, like thinking that, well, I mean, we have to have the best ideas and the best actors and best uh, roles and, and it shouldn't be like restricted by, by these kind of things. But this was some time ago when I still was naive to think that equality <laughs> happens just like that. And now I know it doesn't. So I've, I've changed my opinion. I think it would be a great idea to make sure that all different kind of voices are being heard and represented. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I haven't formed an official opinion. I certainly wouldn't have anything against quotas. I would welcome them quite warmly. I think it's also very important that it's not just the funding that's uh, taken into consideration you know i feel like in finland we are still behind most of the western world in having variety in our stories and yeah. and uh, representation so it's also schools that have to take that into mm -hmm. consideration i mean film school it's yeah. granting organizations that have to think about it it's different programs that I know luckily have been and are being developed for minority voices to be heard. And then very much, I think we have to really look into like, what do we consider minority stories? Um, you know, like, can't, could we just see stories? Right. And you know, like, it's, it's, it's a hard question. Like, but uh, yes, I'm very much pro diversity in, in Finnish film. I would love to see much, much, much more in all the categories you mentioned, be it gender, sexuality, or racial variety. Uh, I have to move Kitty. <laughs> Hello, Kitty. He has an opinion on the matter too. Um, Good. More animal films. Yes, <laughs> yes. especially about or cats, cats, about birds. <laughs> Not about dogs. No. Photos <laughs> for cats. <laughs> I mean, but but you raise a very good point, and that's it's something I always forget about the quota system. is It's not just the funding possibilities; it's also the professional uh, positions as well. You know, female scriptwriters, editors, producers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that that's a very good point. Um, and I do have to say that I I think Finland has made tremendous strides in the past, you know, ten years. Um, at least when it comes to female filmmaking. Um, now, it's not just the, the directors that were involved with this story, but um, you have so many other uh, female-led Finnish stories being told on the international uh, scene. So um, I think Finland has, I, I think there's there's a lot of 
positive things coming out of Finland right now in terms of, of filmmaking. Um, at least that's, that's my humble opinion. Um, and has the Me Too movement made any significant changes um, in Finland and, and to the, the Finnish film industry? What do you think, Reetta? Has it? Well, I think we are still in the turmoil of <laughs> all of this. So yes, there has been some changes made, but I don't know, my current kind of feeling is this that I, I, I'm a bit afraid of the backlash already and it's horrible to feel this way it's really difficult to stay positive but yeah I'm afraid that soon they'll say like okay now we had those female directors you see they got to make their stories and then we get back to, back to normal but let's hope that's not the case but since there are no quotas or anything like I don't know I don't know how this will be, but at least now we are more aware of this. And I've noticed that in panel discussions and and whatnot, there are more women <laughs> invited to them. So without right. even always pointing out that right. here is a female director, they are just there because they are the right. experts on the subject matter, which is great. Because it was still like five years ago that the only panels I got invited to were where I had to say like, what's it like to be a female director? And my favorite answer was always like, well, if I'm pregnant or menstruating, it can be really hard. Mm. But other than that, but that was a stupid answer. Of course, mm. yeah, I know what, but it was frustrating to be asked only right. for these kind of panels. Right. Right. I have great faith in that the awareness that Reta mentioned is here to stay. I don't know, uh, I, can, I, I don't have a crystal ball on how many female-led films and female stories will come out in the future, but I feel like one thing that's here to stay, at least for now, who knows about the next wave of whatever, but is this, you can't bypass these situations so easily you can't mansplain to me when i go to a financer meeting and i have a story about three girls you can't ask me what's important about this story or like why would i care about these girls through lives or you know why would you be the right director for this? you can't sort of like you know i i can sit there and say what is this like some like pre me to BS, you know, like you kind of have that me to card in a way in, in like a good, I'm joking, but I'm not, you know, like you can kind of call it out. You can put it on the table and be like, Hey, uncle, don't mansplain this to me. I have 20 years of experience of filmmaking just because I have red lipstick doesn't mean I don't know what I'm doing. You know, like you can kind of like have the attitude a bit at least. The, um, the, yeah, it can also be an auntie <laughs> who is saying that. True, but, true, like, very the true. classic one being like, why this film? We already had, what, like two years ago, we had this film about a woman. <laughs> like, these are actual comments from <laughs> financers mm. still mm. two years ago. But what but probably hasn't changed enough, unfortunately, I think, is the how we perceive the stories with a female character like i i was told by someone that the film with the three girls <laughs> that i have um in post production right now is is um is not of national significance mm. for example yeah. and yeah it probably isn't national significance in the same way as like a film about Finnish war right. with men fighting it. Mm -hmm. But right. why couldn't a film about current day three girls living in today's society and trying to navigate it be of national significance? Right. Like I ask that, but how long will it take for people to actually see that? Another person said that because in this film, nothing bad happens to these girls, even if they're really they're really courageous and they do what they want, but it's it's not a film where them doing what they want leads them to trouble. They don't get raped or nearly raped and they don't even get in any sort of harm's way or danger. They actually just like do, it's, it's normal teenage story in a way without like it needing to be like, you know, this 
anxiety driven thing where this mm. like terrible thing happens to these girls mm. and like someone said to me middle-aged men at least won't understand this because they will be like huh like nothing happens to these girls right. but if you had the same story about existential you know i don't know boyhood pains or whatever i don't think the same people would ask why is it significant so mm. this i think still is in development but that's international and that's like a massive question like what kind of stories do we consider worth telling and right. and and what what is a hero for example right. what 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 does it consist of like yeah. we're all dealing with with those questions yeah. i think but i think i think what you know like why what the significance of of as you're saying what's the significance of this story i mean i think what the film at least the force of habit what I, i i feel one of the strengths is it just shows the poisoning effect of these subtle small little incidences you know that are that just have an effect you know on 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 the people that they ever happened to and like in the people around them so you know uh with your film you know how it just sort of Ali, how it just sort of just builds up and then you know both the uh, wife and the husband are just don't know what to do and um or the scene at, at, at the at an employment where you know the women even turn against uh the accuser uh so um, i and i think that's I, i think that's another powerful point of the film um it just shows the poisoning effect of these They may seem insignificant, but they're not. Um, so, yeah, and actually, that makes me think of the fact that one thing that was important to us in this film was that the uh, examples we have are sort of um, uh, low key in a way, if for lack of a better word. You know, like we don't have anything quite huge of course there's the trial which is a very significant uh, you know rape case trial but um otherwise these are unfortunately stories that have happened to a lot of the viewers i had numerous women come to say to me that they have experienced every single one of them or at least uh, maybe with the exception of the court case um but they know of someone who has also so that it's sort of approachable we we wanted to keep it approachable right. you you can't push it away by saying ah oh, that's like rough and that happens to others we right. want it to be something that has happened to all of us mm-hmm. and, and being involved with a project uh such as force of nature do you feel like your outlook has changed at all or no well I actually would say that the process itself uh, was a very sort of empowering one. So mm-hmm. that um, I don't know that it changed my prospect in the sense that I would be now awakened to the fact that, oh, women can be collaborating. I, I didn't not think of that before, but certainly it grew um, sort of the idea of solidarity even stronger mm-hmm. and understanding that together we can we can um, change things and we can sort of not feel shame. There's so much shame around mm. this issue and so much mm. shame around like being the one who speaks out. And that's what was empowering about it. That now that we all speak about it together, then it's sort of easier to keep talking about it and sort of, yeah, not feel ashamed. Yeah, I agree that the collective and us all working together was probably the biggest kind of thing to take away from this that i don't know filmmaking is often like from the point of view of writer director is quite lonely even Mm -hmm. though it's always collective work you work with a lot of other professionals but most of the work you do kind of on your own the most kind of like the sensitive part of the work is what you do on your own and of course it will be like that in the future too but I noticed that I stay in touch with the force of habit directors more than I used to with like my other colleagues and I ask their advice be it like I need to know who's a good assistant director or 
have you ever encountered this or that kind of situation on set or whatever it is so like professionally like it really has helped me and and uh, and yeah, I, I call my colleagues like on the right. telephone, <laughs> which didn't really happen before. Maybe the COVID has <laughs> has something to do with this because I don't see anybody at the premieres or where I used to see my colleagues. But anyhow, it's been a great gift wow. to find my way back to 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 the sisters, most of them being women. <laughs> yeah, here, here. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, uh, so what's the next projects? I know you were talking a little bit, Ali, about uh, your post-production, but um, you can you talk a little bit more about the film? And, and as well, Rita, I know you just had a feature film come out just mm -hmm. at lockdown occurring. So I don't know, you want to talk about that? You want to start? Yeah. Well, I can say, yeah, I had a, a, a feature length film uh, called Laughing Matters that just premiered uh, in November when the lockdown, or not, it's not called lockdown, but anyway, these restrictions in Finland right. got like tougher. And, and so that's unfortunate, but the film is great. <laughs> and I'm hoping for a good future for it. It's set in a, in a world of uh, stand-up comedy. Okay. And uh, now I'm writing, uh, I don't know yet, will it be a novel or will it be a film? <laughs> but I'm writing a lot, yeah. She That's also right. published her first novel last year. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I yeah. never. <laughs> My film is, uh, like I said, the story of three girls. I guess in short, it's, um, it's basically a story of three girls on three Fridays, kind of trying to explore teenage life and the um, big questions of that very delicate uh, uh, time in life. Two of the girls fall in love with each other and the third is looking for sexual pleasure which she has trouble finding or feeling and she's quite concerned about that. And uh, it's an interesting film because it's a very small story. Like I said, it's set on three consecutive Fridays. So it's a very small snippet of time. It's kind of like a fragment of their lives. But then um, the questions that these teenagers are dealing with are kind of like the size of the universe, because everything, of course, in teenagers' life mm -hmm. is the size of the universe. So um, it's, yeah, it talks about a lot of stuff without that stuff being the topic of it. Like, it's not like a, a same-sex story at all. Like, that's not, never even mentioned that the two girls are of same sex when they fall in love. It's their story and their their growing pains and their love story and it's because of the smallness and because of it not it not like tackling these themes it ended up becoming like a tad revolutionary or I don't that sounds like a really big word but kind of like quite fresh in that sense it's it's kind of it's it's not written by me it's written by two uh, writers Daniela Hapulinen and Ilona Ahti and uh and they've really tapped onto something quite fresh with the story. So, yeah, I'm eager to to uh, get it out there. We're almost done with the editing and the picture lock we have in a couple of weeks. So. Oh wow! Congrats! <laughs> I didn't know that it's so far already. Yeah, thank well, you. Goes. Both Bye. of you are writers. Um, do you like? Do you prefer working with other people's work, or do you prefer to work with your own work? I'm just always curious about. That. I prefer that people send me brilliant scripts that mm -hmm. I don't have to write. <laughs> no, I don't. I it's both, you know, like when there's a great script that you're of course just uh eager I am of course just uh, eager to to get to get to the directing of it and uh yeah, but then if you have like a personal story that needs to come out, like for example in Force of Habit the the story that I wrote for it was the easiest story that I've ever written. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm terrible at writing and I really hate writing. It's not my comfort zone at all. Um, I'm, I can say I'm a solid director, but I'm like, I don't even know the words for my writing, but that story came out very easily because mm -hmm. somehow I knew what I was doing. It just sort of like came out. I didn't mm -hmm. 
have to do much. So if there's a story like that coming out, sure. But otherwise, just send me brilliant scripts and I'll concentrate on the directing. Well, same here. Um, I, I must add that I do enjoy a lot uh, kind of like discussing someone else's script and, and, and I do participate very actively in the writing process, even if it's not my text. And then, of course, I have to find a, a writer who is willing to do that. So, so um, yeah, but I enjoy that a lot. Because, I mean, like I said, directing and writing is often very lonely. So it's nice to work with nice right. people who have great yeah. stories to share. Well, thank you so much, Oli. And thank you so much, Rita. Uh, it was a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so Force of Habit is on view at Scandinavia.org from March 12th through the 18th. And I hope everyone sees this and tells their friends. It's available throughout the U.S. Um, and I, was there, has there any been talk about any U.S. distribution deals, or do you know of? I actually don't know. I think this would be Eli Toivoniemis. Okay. Uh, like well, he might know something. <laughs> we don't. Uh, so it's on view this week. So please do check it out. It's a it's a it's a difficult subject to watch, but it's a it's an important film to watch. So I strongly and funny and funny. <laughs> I highly recommend it. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this morning or today. Thank you. Thanks and good afternoon. <laughs>